I want to dive into the message today, and uh, it's going to be a bit of an abbreviated message today, uh, again, so we can have more time uh, for a special prayer time at the end today. We've been in this uh, series called Speak to the Rock, and if, if you're new with us, if you're just joining us and you haven't been a part of this teaching series yet, it's really a series about faith and prayer and miracles, and we're drawing off of this story in the Old Testament, and it's actually in two different places, but in Numbers chapter 20, uh, God tells Moses when the people of God have come out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, they're headed to the promised land, and they're living in the desert wilderness, they, they run out of food, they run out of water, running out of water, you got about three days max in a desert situation, maybe only one or two days before you're going to die, and so it's a life or death situation, and they're like, we need water, they're kind of grumbling, complaining, and God tells Moses, I want you to speak to this rock, and I'm going to bring water out of the rock to provide for the people. And so we've been talking about how the rock signifies our problems in life. And we tend to view our problems as signs that God's not really with us. But really God views our problems as opportunities for him to prove his presence and provision for us. Amen. That was week one. And so, and so we've been writing prayer requests on getting a rock, doing a prophetic act, writing prayer requests, desires of the heart, needs, some of you may need a miracle in your life. You might need a mountain move that only God can move. And praise the Lord Jesus that we serve a mountain moving God. He said, nothing will be impossible for the one who believes. And so we talked about week two that the, the biggest mountain that ever needs moved, if that's true, if what Jesus said is true, is your own unbelief, is your own lack of trusting God. And so we, week two, we, we worked at healing or breaking unbelief uh, in us so that we truly can trust him and believe in him to be a God who answers prayer. And so uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that Jesus is the spiritual rock that followed them in the desert and provided for them. Okay, so he was the, the one behind all of that. But he's also saying that's a prophetic parable for who Jesus is to us. Jesus is our rock. Scripture says he is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone or the foundation of faith, the foundation of the kingdom of God. And so Hebrews 4 says, let us therefore enter boldly the throne room of grace so we can receive help in our time of need. And so we can boldly come into the presence of God. They used to have to make sacrifices, sacrifice animals to pay for their sin just to be able to get into the temple courts and make themselves right with God. We don't have to do that. Jesus paid for us once and for all. Now we can come into his presence and we have this huge privilege we call prayer where we can speak to the rock, our rock, Jesus. And he loves to provide. He said in John 14, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that God can be glorified through the Son. We serve a God who delights to answer the prayers of his people. Amen? So that's kind of a summary of what we've been talking about. Today, really what I want to talk to you about is this. God doesn't just want to be your rock of provision. He wants to transform you into a rock of faith and cause provision and power and even his presence to flow out of you to bless the people in the world around you. So God doesn't just want you to always come to him. He wants to transform your heart, your life, and make you into a rock of faith and cause life-giving provision, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit to flow from you, to bless the people around you, to bring them to salvation in Christ, to bless them with healing, to bless them with deliverance and freedom. And if you're a believer, you carry the power of Jesus in you, the presence of Jesus through his Holy Spirit, the same power that rose Christ from the dead. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 7. It was at the Feast of Tabernacles. I touched on this a little last week, but Jesus went down to the Feast of Tabernacles. This was a week-long holiday. They took off work for a week, and they celebrate. They would build temporary shelters. It's kind of like a camping holiday. They would intentionally camp out for a week to commemorate the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. That was the Feast of Tabernacles for an entire week. And on the last day of the feast, that was the greatest day of the feast. And they would have talked about the miracles that God did. And one of the biggest things they would have talked about was when God brought water out of the rock. Just like at Christmas time, we talk about the nativity. And Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem. And, and they had the baby. And he was laid in the manger, right? And we talk about this every year at Christmas. Well, every year at Feast of Tabernacles, they would have talked about we were in the wilderness. We didn't have water. And God brought water out of a rock you know and this is what they would have talked about and it says this with that in mind it says in John 7 37 on the last and greatest day of the festival Jesus stood and said in a loud voice 
let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He's saying, I am the spiritual rock, okay? I'm gonna make provision for you. Let them come to me and drink. But watch what he says in verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, he's referencing a scripture in Isaiah, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Did you catch that? He said, he didn't just say, come to me and drink. We gotta come to Jesus and drink. But when you drink the water that Jesus gives you, it doesn't just provide for you. It transforms you, and then something happens. You become a place out of which the life of God flows to bless the world around you. Now, what does that mean? John tells us in the next verse. Now, I don't know if John knew in the moment what he meant, but John is writing this towards the end of his life after Acts 1 and 2 and Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and this is what John says. says By this... He meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So when you become a believer in Jesus, scripture says you receive the Holy Spirit the moment you believe. And that transforms you. Scripture, Jesus said it's like uh, being reborn. You're a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5. You're transformed. You have the same power within you as a believer in Jesus that rose Christ from the dead. And Jesus says that's going to become like a river bubbling up, flowing out of you to where you can't contain it. You get so filled with the Spirit that it overflows from your life to bless the lives of people around you. And so I've got good news for you today. You're getting a new name today. Getting a new name today, okay? When God would do something new in someone's life in scripture, he'd often change their name. He changed Jacob to Israel, right? And he did this in the Old Testament and he did this in the New Testament many different times. A new name signified this is your destiny. Your parents may have given you one name. God's given you a new name today, okay? Your new name, so to speak, work with me here, is RJ, okay? RJ is all of our new name, okay? I had a friend growing up in elementary school. His name was RJ. He was named after his dad. His dad's name was Rob. He was Robbie Jr. He didn't like Jr. He didn't like Robbie. He was called R.J. Robbie Jr. We have this uh, uh, tradition in our culture where we'll name kids after their dad, right? They're going to be like their dad. And we'll give a comma and a J.R. period. Junior means he's like his dad, but he gets the same name. Did you know Jesus did that with one of his disciples? In John chapter 1 verse 42, Jesus first meets this guy named Simon. And Simon is going to, has a huge destiny. He's going to be one of the main leaders of the early church. And scripture says in John 1 42, when Jesus met Simon, he said to him, you are Simon, son of John. Now you have to understand this right here is a prophetic word of knowledge moment. They've not met before. And Jesus is telling, it'd be like, you've never met Jesus. And he walks up and goes, you're Claudia Hamlin from Mount Orb. And she goes, how do you know that? You know, (laughs) because he's Jesus, because the Holy Spirit's telling him. So this is a moment where Simon is recognizing, whoa, who is this guy? He's got something going on with him that's supernatural. So he says, you're Simon, son of John. And then he says this, you will be called Cephas. Cephas is an Aramaic word. Jesus spoke Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, maybe even a few other languages. The Aramaic word for rock. So see, you will be called rock, Jesus says, which when translated, your English Bible says, is Peter. It's actually when translated into Greek is Petra, where we get the English name Peter. But if we were to translate it into English, it just means rock. He's saying, I'm giving you a new name. It's kind of like a nickname but it is your destiny. It's who I'm calling you to become. Jesus sees the potential in you. He sees the spiritual gifts he's put, going to put in you or has put in you. He sees who you're meant to become and he will call that out of you before you have started living it. He'll call it out of you. He'll, he will say it to you. So this is a prophetic word. It's a prophetic moment. And when the spirit of God or when someone 
a follower of Jesus says something prophetic to you that is in line with your destiny, oh my goodness, it will, it will, it will do some things inside of you. It will begin to bring that out. It will, it will activate that calling. It will make you aware of it and go, oh my goodness, this is what I need to be doing. This is how I need to live. And, and you'll start to live into that. And so he told Peter, your name is the rock. Now, what's interesting is we know Jesus is the rock, capital T, capital R, cornerstone of faith. That's what we've been talking about. And so he looks at Peter and says, you are, you are the rock. And what, what, he's, what he's saying figuratively, metaphorically, spiritually is, this is kind of like PJ, right? Peter Jr., the rock Jr., R.J., someone who is like Jesus. And this is who God is calling us to become today. In fact, Peter makes this connection in 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5. He's writing towards the end of his life to the early church, and he says, as you come to him, the living stone in your English Bible, L and S are probably capitalized there. He's like, he is the capital S living stone. As you come to him, the stone that's been rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, verse, verse 5, like living stones, lowercase l and s, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Scripture says in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The early church at first had no name. They just called it the way. The way of what? The way of Jesus. Jesus is the way. We don't know what to call this. It's the way. They're following him. But at the city of, of Antioch, eventually they said, these people are Christians. And the word Christian meant Christ one, one like Christ. These people who love this guy, Jesus, they're like him. And so we're going to call them Christian. If, we, if you use the rock language, we're going to call them RJ, Rock Jr. That's your destiny, like Peter. Peter says he's the living stone. He is the rock. But we all are called to be rocks like him and he wants to transform us to be rocks of faith solid secure in your faith but also to bring living water out of you to bless the world around you bless the people around you what's the living water john says that's the holy spirit so how do we experience this i want to talk about two aspects of the holy spirit you could call them two functions of the holy spirit but it's the indwelling which brings salvation and it is the anointing which is power gifts so on and so forth, okay? And these, these can happen at the moment of salvation at the same time, but they can also happen separately. And I know that because we see that in Scripture, okay? And I want to walk you through this very quickly. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? To receive the Holy Spirit is to receive Jesus. So you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you profess faith in him. Romans 10 also says if you believe that God, that Jesus rose from the dead and profess he is your Lord with your mouth, then you will be saved for all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? Ephesians 1 says the moment you do that, the moment you accept Christ, the moment you receive him by faith and say, I repent of my sins, I agree with God, Jesus is Lord. Ephesians 1 says this, 13 and 14, you also were included with Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, the moment you believed, you were marked in him with a holy seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So God in us is a deposit guaranteeing that one day we will be fully in God in heaven. Isn't that cool? And so when you believe in Jesus, the moment you believe, the moment you profess faith, boom, you get the Holy Spirit indwelling the spirit of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is the literal spirit of Jesus himself. Comes to dwell inside of you. You are saved. That is salvation, okay? You've got God inside of you. That's, that is eternal life. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. You know him. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. The indwelling of the Spirit brings transformation, new creation, and the fruit of that is the fruit of the character of Jesus, which is the fruit mentioned in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Now, you still got your flesh, 
right? And that new creation's a new creation. It's a little baby. And so that new creation's got to grow up and become more mature and become more powerful than your old man, your flesh, your brain has neural pathways that are still rooted in sin. And, and your spirit, your thoughts, your new man has to inform your brain. And the good news is science has proven and given the good word of God a good amen that your mind can be renewed, which will renew your brain, which will renew your habits, which will renew your life. Amen. And so that's what happens when you get saved. Amen. That's awesome. That's the indwelling. But scripture also talks about what there's many terms used for it. The anointing the filling of the Spirit, the empowering of the Spirit, uh, uh, the baptism of the Spirit. The word baptism means immersion, right? When you get baptized, when you make a profession of faith with your mouth, then you should get baptized in water, Jesus said. And that signifies everything that we believe as Christians. You're going under the water. You're dying to your old life. You're, you're, You're dying to your sin. You're, it's, you're, you're dying to yourself. You're coming back up out of that watery grave, as Scripture calls it, and, and, and you're living the new life in Christ, right? And it's a prophetic act declaring that I'm going to be a new, this new creation Jesus has called me to be. That's in water, okay? But John the Baptist, who was baptizing people in water, said one coming after me who's going to baptize you, immerse you in the Holy Spirit, okay? To be immersed means um, all in, Right? Like, like submerged in. The, the Greek word just means submerge. Like we, it's become a religious term, but they, it just meant submerged. They, they found ancient Greek texts that talk about cucumbers being baptized in vinegar to make pickles, right? Now that sounds funny to us because it's such a religious term, um, but baptizo is the, is the Greek word, and that's where we, that we've called it baptism. Now it's a religious term, but to, in Greek... It just means submerged. You're just getting submerged. So you get submerged in water. It's a prophetic act. Jesus told us to do it, right, when we become believers in him. But John the Baptist said, the one coming after me, Jesus, he's going to baptize you, submerge you, immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Figuratively or spiritually, what that means is to be overwhelmed by. You're overwhelmed by the goodness of God. You're overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. Right? You've, many of you have probably experienced a, an immersion, a filling of the Holy Spirit. You didn't even know that's what it was. You, were, you just heard me preaching. You're just like, oh, God, it's so good. Oh, God, it's so good. And you're just overwhelmed. You're just being filled up. Right? When you get filled up, guess what happens? What does Psalm 23 say? My cup, what? Overflows. What's that old song Jamie likes to sing? Uh, what, what are the, my, what's that guy's name? Come on, Jamie. Michael, Michael what? Michael what? Combs. Combs. Drinking from the saucer because my cup's overflowing, right? When, When you get immersed or filled with the Spirit, your cup starts overflowing. And when when the Spirit overflows in you, in your heart and mind, guess what? It starts to come out. What's that look like? You start doing or saying things because you're excited because God's moving, right? You get overwhelmed by God. You heard some people shouting during worship. Why? Because we're singing these songs, chains break. Oh, I've experienced that. Oh, God. Ah! Getting filled up. Woo! You know? Comes out in a shout of praise. It comes out, you're talking to someone. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It happened to me. It's happened to me a lot. Somebody's talking to you and they're just telling your life story. And it's just like, you're hearing this and you're like, oh, oh, God's just telling me all this. Oh, 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 shut up so I can pray for you. <laughs> you know, and you just pray all this stuff for them because the Spirit's like, let me out. <sighs> I want to bless them. Right? It, it's different ways, different what we might call manifestations of what the Holy Spirit is doing in someone. And so that's what happens when you get filled. So uh, uh, receiving the Spirit happens at the moment you believe, okay? Whether you had a big emotional experience or not, it happened, okay? And so uh, that's a one-time thing, okay? You got it, and you got it. All right, good. It's not going to be taken from you, all right? You got the Spirit of God, okay? But a filling of the Spirit, a baptism of the Spirit, an anointing of the Spirit, an empowering of the Spirit, a gifting of the Spirit, these are all synonymous terms in Scripture. When you really study out the meanings and what they mean, and and, uh, they're really, I think, giving different facets of what that experience is like. But that can happen multiple times, okay? That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, 
And the verb tense there, be filled, is constantly be being filled. It, it gives a word picture of a, a sailboat, and the sail is constantly, continually being filled with the wind. And wind is also a picture of what? The Spirit, Jesus said in John 3. So constantly be being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Now, we know there are things we can do to position ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Read scripture. You're reading the thoughts of God. You're reading the, the word of God, all right? You get filled up with the word of God. You get filled, right? You come to church. You hear sermons. You worship. You pray. There's different things you can do to position yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so these are kind of two separate functions of the Spirit. It's, it's a bit confusing because they can happen at the, at the same time. Some of you, when you got saved, you got filled with the Spirit. You're so pumped up about it. You're like, ah, you know, what's happening to me? You know, God gave you gifts, and God empowered you in those gifts and gave you a calling all at the same time. And you're just pumped, right? And that can happen. But sometimes you get you accept Christ, you get saved, right? You got the Spirit, you start the fruit of the Spirit, you know, your character, integrity, love of Jesus, you know, you're living that out. And then at a later date, God goes, wow. <laughs> and I think that's what he does, you know. We maybe don't hear the wapow, but he gives you a calling. He fills you with the spirit. You're just like, oh my goodness. You know, you get spiritual gifts. You get empowered. You start living into that. And so they can be separate experiences. They can happen at the same time. Um, and so how do we position ourselves uh, to receive the spirit, to, to be filled with the spirit? Again, receiving the spirit is believing in Jesus. Making that profession of faith, you receive the spirit of God living within you. But scripture talks about one thing in particular, and I'm going to say two things that kind of go together. The laying on of hands with prayer, okay? The laying on of hands, meaning prayer with laying on of hands. Scripture talks about this. To, to see people be filled with the Spirit, okay? And also prophesying, okay? Now, some of you who don't like that word because you grew up in a church that the word prophesy or prophesying felt scary to you. Uh, because your church didn't do that kind of stuff, you know? But some of you who, who feel a little uh, nervous about that, you, you've actually done it probably when you're praying for someone and you're just like, Lord, and all of a sudden these really specific things start coming into your mind for this person. You start praying really specific things. You're like, man, I don't even know why I'm praying this for this person. And you don't even realize it, but the Spirit of God is giving you specific things to pray for that person at that time, at that place that has to do with God's will for their life, and you don't even know it's happening, but you're prophesying over that person. To prophesy means to speak under the unction or inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay? And so I'm prophesying right now, right? I'm unpacking God's word, but I'm explaining with, with my words, but it's under the inspiration that the Spirit has given me this week as I've prepared, and a lot of it happens on the cuff as I'm speaking too. And so it's prophesying. Prophesying can be future telling or forth telling, like, hey, God wants to do this in your life, so get ready, you know? That's happened in our church, you know? Somebody around Christmas time, one of our friends, one of our uh, greeters out there said, hey, God told me to tell you, you're getting ready to receive a new ministry. And they're like, okay, cool. You know, he was prophesying to them. God gave him a prophetic word for them. Well, <laughs> We'll be telling you this story here in a few weeks, but long story short, over the next several months, God started doing a whole lot, and they're getting preparing to go start a new church. Isn't that cool? And so he was prophesying into their life. Maybe he didn't even know it. Maybe they didn't even realize what was happening, but that's what he was doing. And I don't know about you, but I just like to use the words the Bible uses, and I... I I was going to say I don't know why a lot of American churches get weird about using the word prophesy or prophetic. I actually do know why, but um, I don't want to get into that today. Um, and so we use that language around here. And so there's an interesting verse um, in Timothy that I want to read to you where Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy, and he says this, 1 Timothy 4.14, Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through... The prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. There it is all in one verse, right? The laying on of hands to pray for people, right? Asking God to fill them, asking God to, to just bless them with the Holy Spirit, right? But then apparently as they were doing that, somebody there that day had this very specific word for Timothy. We're not told what it is. But it apparently was a, had to do with a spiritual gift. Maybe it was, you know, you're going to be a teacher in the house of God. A teacher is a position, but also a, a spiritual gift, the spiritual gift of teaching, right? We don't know what it was. But Paul's saying don't neglect it. 
Many of you have been filled with the Spirit at some point, anointed in the Spirit, given spiritual gifts, but perhaps you've been neglecting those things. And perhaps God's going to renew that in you today, okay? And so we as a church want to do what Scripture says. And so we want to facilitate times periodically where we do this for our church. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when people get baptized here in water, uh, we immediately have them go to one of the corners of the room usually, and we have our prayer team lay hands on them, and pray over them. And usually very specific things come out in those prayers. And if if you are up close like I am a lot of the time, you can see people crying and people like, oh, God's really moving, God's really speaking. What's happening? They're being filled with the Spirit. They're being empowered. They're, you know, they're blessing them in the Holy Spirit, right? And so that's that's one of the ways we like to do that. Um, I became kind of convinced as a church, I want to facilitate this in a greater way a few years ago. And so we did this in 2019. We did it in 2020 because, you know, 2020 doesn't count. Can we just all agree with that? Just doesn't count. All right, moving on. Um, and so, and so we wanted to facilitate a time where our prayer team and our leaders can pray for you all if you want us to. If not, you're welcome to leave when we start the prayer time today. And believe me when I say this, there's no shame if you need if you're like I'm not ready for this. I don't. I was weird. I'm brand new. I'm never even accepted Christ. It's my first time in church ever. And you just are like I'd rather wait and just get you know, get to know you a little better first, (laughs) you know, that's fine, and you're welcome to leave, and so no pressure, but we want to facilitate times periodically where our leaders and our prayer team just pray to bless you, to see you be filled with the Holy Spirit, Uh, if God gives us a specific word to pray for you, to to speak that to you, to pray that over you, um, and and just just see God move in this place, and so we're going to end today with that in mind, okay, and that's what we're going to do uh, as we close today, all right, And so a couple other scriptures, just to, again, give you the scriptural support of all this and where we see this in scripture. Um, Acts, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6 talks about the laying on of hands as a basic elementary teaching of the Christian faith. It says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, repenting of your sins, faith in God, turning to Jesus, all right, in faith, instruction about cleansing rites. He's talking about water baptism there. The laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So the practice of laying hands on people to pray for them, to be filled with the Holy Spirit should be an elementary, basic, fundamental 101. If you played sports growing up, you played high school basketball like I did, you know. I played from the time I was like in second grade. By the time I'm, you know, sophomore in high school, you know, we've done this a million times. We've had many seasons, right? What do you start every season with? Three-man weave, let's do some layups. All right, we're going to shoot free throws. We're going to do dribble drills. Why do you do that? Fundamentals, fundamentals, laying the foundation. And, and this writer of Hebrews is like, we want to move on from the foundation to the deeper things of God. Yes. Oh, that's my, that's my desire. Anybody in here like, oh, I want to go to the deeper things of God. Yes, 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 yes. But to do that, you have to master the fundamentals. It's got to be like a regular thing, just part of your life. You, you, it's so habitual. It's so part of you. Don't even think about it. You just do it. It's just practice, right? You just, it's just who you are. If you want to get to the deeper, you can't get to the deeper things by skipping over the fundamentals. And scripture calls the laying on of hands the fundamentals. Um, some, a lot of modern American churches think, well, this is something you do when somebody's called to be a pastor, then the leaders lay hands on them. And that's, it's like a leadership thing. That is not the, the, the picture that scripture paints, The picture that scripture paints is this is for everyone. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Acts 8, 14 through 17, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because, interesting, listen, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They received the Holy Spirit inwardly, the indwelling. They were saved, but he hadn't come on them in power. Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit indwells in you. No, when he comes on you in power, anoints you, gifts you, and empowers you to use those gifts. And so then Peter and John placed their hands on them, verse 17, and they received the Holy Spirit, okay? And so they were empowered in the Spirit, right? And then, and then what happened? The river bubbles up. And they're like, woo, God's good. Oh, my goodness. Wow, I've never felt this way. (gasps) And they start praising God, prophesying, and speaking in tongues was a regular manifestation in those days, right? 
And, and still today, some people speak in other languages and prayer languages that God gives them. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. A lot of the American church is afraid of it because it's weird. And it's weird because they haven't known it because they never tried it because a lot of them have come up with theologies that go actually against scripture. And they think it's called cessationism. These things have ceased. And really, it was just for the apostles. And except there's nowhere in scripture that says that. And so our Holy Spirit is our power. And the reason the church of God in America especially is so, is so weak and dying out is because we have a form of godliness, but we're denying the power. Because, because honestly, we have, a, we have a, an atheistic worldview in America. So it's secular humanism. Well, we, t- we don't really believe in the supernatural as a culture, right? Because of science, because of all the things we figured out and all, this, all the stuff, right? Um, but listen, you need to be aware of your own culture's strongholds and lenses. Uh, and we tend to look at scripture as Christians through a lens of unbelief. And so we get into this stuff, which is supernatural, right? Which is Holy Spirit. And a whole lot of churches go, that's weird. I don't know about that. I'm not even going to try to do that because it feels weird. I don't know. And you know what? Somewhere along the way, I just think that's not for today. See, I just think that was for the apostles. And that's where cessationism comes from. There's cessationists and there's continuationists. Those are the two major branches of of Christianity in relation to the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. And so we're definitely a continuationist church. These things have continued. It's it's still today uh, how it was in the New Testament. And so we need the Holy Spirit. And, And scripture says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Man, you teach cessationism, you stay away from spiritual gifts, you don't lay hands and pray for people, you, know, whew, you are quenching the spirit. And then you wonder why your church doesn't want to do anything or get involved or, or, or serve the community or, or worship, and it's just like, oh, do we have to be here? Why? They're not being filled with the spirit, and if they are, it's getting pushed and pushed down, and, and they're told to stop feeling that way and believing that way, amen? And so... That is really what's happening in the American church landscape. And we don't want to be that way. We just want to be faithful to scripture. And, and if you grew up that way, um, you know, we all start somewhere, right? It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. And I would just encourage you to, when you read scripture, take off the lens of how you grew up, take off the lens of your culture, just read scripture. And you tell me if I'm right in these things. When you read and go, wow, let me read you one more story and then we'll, then we'll get into our prayer time. Acts 19, 1 through 7. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's a lot of the American church today. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? And they said this, John's baptism. And Paul goes, oh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Salvation. They've been saved, which Scripture says in Ephesians 1. They receive the Holy Spirit in them, the indwelling, seal, deposit, guaranteeing that one day they'll get to go to heaven. Awesome. But Paul wasn't content with that. What did he do? Verse 6. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. There's that, there's that, what is that? participle of is it a participle I don't know part of speech on not in on isn't that interesting the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied there about 12 men in all now was Paul starting a church are these leaders are these elders oh we need to set them apart for leadership so I'm gonna lay my hands on you no these were normal people they just believed in Jesus Paul goes let me tell you apparently Paul had become convinced uh y'all need the Holy Spirit and when he showed up at this church in, in whatever city this was in, he goes, something's kind of off here. Seems kind of dead here. Seems like y'all aren't even really happy to be here. Did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. That's the problem, right? And so he diagnoses it, and then he tells them about Jesus. They received Jesus. Okay, cool, check mark. Now I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit, Okay. And they're anointed, they're gifted, they're empowered. Man, and when you have an experience like that, man, you, let me tell you, you want to serve God. You, you get a filling with the, an experience of the Father's love, and you're just like, it humbles you, and you're just different. It marks you, you know, and uh, it's hard to explain. And I've had this happen a few times in my life. These moments, some of you have had this happen explicitly. Some of you have had it happen. You didn't really realize that's what was happening, but that's what was happening. You're probably remembering a moment in your life right now. We're like, wow, I was really overwhelmed that day, and God was so good, and it really changed my life, and I started living differently. Yeah, you were filled with the Spirit. And listen, Ephesians 5, 18, be f- constantly be being filled with the Spirit, all right? So this is not just a one-time thing. Man, we want to we bless you today.